everyone and welcome to the Sanya Faruqi show. Joining us today, we have Dr. Amina Gurib Fakim. She's a Mauritian politician and biodiversity scientist. Dr. Amina is also the sixth president and first female president of the Republic of Mauritius until 2018. Dr. Amina has been managing director of CITPR and I, professor at University of Mauritius, where she served successfully as dean and pro vice chancellor and manager at the Mauritius Research Councilor. She has received multiple awards, including Laurel UNESCO Prize for Women in Science, the African Union Commission Award for Women in Science. She has been elevated to the order of CSK and GCSK. She received Ante Alia Légion d'Honneur by Government of France, Order of St. George, Sempar of Arbol by Germany, Trailblazing Award for Political Leadership by World Women Leaders Council, Iceland. In 2016, Dr. Amina was in the Forbes list for the 100 Most Powerful Women in the World, first amongst the top 100 women in Africa Forbes list in 2017 and 2019. She's been honored as one of foreign policy magazines 2015 Global Thinkers and Honorary President of the International Engineering and Technology Institute. <laughs> uh, it's an absolute honor to have you on the Sanya Faruqi show today. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much. Good morning and thank you for having me. You are an award-winning biodiversity scientist and have been in the field of science and research for decades. Tell us, did you ever imagine one day you would be leading your country and joining politics? The short answer is never, because I don't come from a political family. Uh, I have uh, no background at all in politics, uh, but I think uh, the qualities I brought to the table at that contractual moment, uh, I think it fitted well with the, with the political narrative. And uh, so these uh, qualities, if I may resume them, uh, they were the fact that I was a woman, I was untainted by politics, I had some credibility, and I was also a, a Muslim woman, because uh, Muslim uh, Islam is a minority religion in Mauritius. So all these in the political world become plus points. So when this was proposed to me, uh, as I said, I have no idea what I was landing myself in for, but I thought to myself, I can serve my country at the highest level, and also I took on uh, the, the narrative from Dr. Kalam from India, because he was also a scientist and he also served India for, for, for many years. And I had the pleasure of meeting him when he came to Mauritius once. Um, so all these put together, I thought to myself, well, let's go for it. So as I had always been uh, uh, quite good at taking risk. So this was yet another piece of, well, that's another risk I took in my life and it paid off. What are some strategies that can help women achieve a more prominent role in politics? What's the one leadership lesson you've learned in your career? Well, up front, I can say that it is not going to be easy because women, I mean, also depending if you add the layer of culture, if you add the layer of religion, uh, it is not uh, an accepted thing uh, to do. Uh, but I personally feel, and I have been saying it all along, that we need more women in that space we need more women because these women, they shape the policy when it's being taken at that particular table. So we need more women, but how to make that woman go there? Uh, the problem is that, you know, um, for too long and uh, it's happening even now as we speak, the self-confidence of a woman is destroyed, if I may use a very strong word, from childhood. And that for me started when I wanted to do a career in science. I was told that uh, science is not for, for, for girls, it's for boys. And if I come back with a degree in science, I will not get a job. So already the self-confidence of that girl child is being damaged. Then the other thing is that, you know, coming from uh, an Asian background, because at the end of the day, we all hail from India. And um, we have a very conservative approach when it comes to women going out there because the political arena is a very brutal one. And uh, women, very often, they don't have the self-confidence and uh, society puts a lot of pressure on them and they, they tend to conform. And by conforming, they do themselves a very big in injustice and they do not take that risk. So I was lucky because I had a father who believed in girls to begin with, gave me an education, and he was always telling me that you can do anything. 
If your brother can do it, so can you. So I grew up with that self-confidence. My father's been telling me this, so he can't be wrong. So this is what I went ahead and, and took all the risks that I could take because I knew behind me there was a family and a supportive family for that matter because when I got married, I also married a husband who also gave me uh, his support. So all this, I think, helps the woman as she forges ahead in whatever career she wants to do, especially in the world of politics. Thanks. Um, so a little about your background, you come from a small town, like you said, you are also coming from a Muslim background, you're a woman, there are already so many glass ceilings that you have to shatter just to step out of the house. How easy or difficult was it to pursue your passion for science to chase your ambitions? Tell us a little about the story of how you became a scientist. I grew up in a village, in fact, it's not even a town, <laughs> it's a very small village. And uh, it's a small village where uh, I had uh, the great honor and the great pleasure of having had uh, an education from, uh, you know, Loreto convent, you know, women, uh, the, the nuns from the Loreto mission, they were in Mauritius. So my father chose um, an institution that provided the best scholastic education for girls. And uh, there was nothing in that village except for the love and care of my family, of my parents. And um, I also had motivated teachers uh, because I went, as I said, to that school. It was very new because it, they had just set up that school very close to my village. Um, there was no infrastructure, but motivated teachers who could uh, instill uh, or infect me with the virus of science. And uh, they actually debunked everything and demystified science as we know it. So teaching science or learning science at the time was, you know, kind of second nature. And uh, it was there, nature, it was provided us with the background. So this is how I got uh, really involved in the sciences. Then came uh, uh, the moonshot moment, literally the moonshot moment in 1969, when in Mauritius, we were one of the very few countries that could watch the landing of men on the moon. And I saw that live and I thought to myself, wow, that was, you know, really was a, 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 a ting moment, you know. And uh, then the second big moment was in 1978 when uh, there was the birth of the test tube baby, baby Brown. So I said to myself, well, if uh, science can be that transformative, and to me, science was everywhere because my teachers were telling me that when you cook, when you do your dishes, you were doing science. So science was everywhere. Uh, science could explain everything, had the answer to it. So I, I was all set and you know, I was already there wanting to pursue a career in science, but not knowing what to do with it. So I just followed my heart. Do you think there are still many factors that deter women from pursuing careers in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics? Why do we still see such a huge gap in women's representation in these areas? Um, I think I can discuss this in two words, structure and stereotype. I'll start with the second one. Uh, stereotype, you know, in our textbooks that we actually give our kids from a very young age, uh, we don't provide sufficient role models uh, for those women who've made it as an entrepreneur, as a scientist, even as a Nobel Prize winner. So already there is a lot of uh, stereotype to be addressed. So the girl, when she's growing up, she doesn't have that role model that can actually uh, show, you know, show her the way in as much as there are others who have been there before. Then in terms of structures, you know, again, all the, all the, all the, all the negatives are stacked against the girl when she's growing up, as is mentioned. I was a prime case, uh, a prime example from a very early age. So all the, all the odds are stacked against the girl. So to address, to make women go into uh, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, or, and I will add one more word, art, so we can make it, we can move from STEM to STEAM. So if we want more of these women out there, we need to address the structure, we need to address the stereotype. Okay. And what did your representation as a scientist and as the first Muslim woman president of the country mean for the community and for women in the country? I think it was a, a really aha moment at the time because uh, nobody had dared before. I had dared. I got there. 
And as I say, through sheer accident, because I still consider myself as an accidental president, as I said, because, you know, I'd never had uh, this, this background before. Uh, so it was a matter of daring. It was a matter of succeeding. And I think uh, for me, the journey all the way to the State House, for me, it was a, a, a message to that girl growing up in my village that she can look up one day or wake up one day and say, I too can make it because someone else has done it through dint of hard work and through taking a risk. So to me, that's more important than my personal journey. Yeah. And have you ever been in a situation that made you think women and power are two incompatible concepts? Do you think there are still many conscious and unconscious biases towards women in politics? I know you've mentioned it earlier, but um, especially towards those in very senior, senior leadership positions. Uh, again, here there's two words, Samia. There's leadership and there's politics. Women in leadership, I was at leadership position when I was a professor. I was at leadership position when I was running my business, my enterprise, because I left university to start my business. So there I was at leadership position. But I think we have to make a distinction between leadership and power. We need more women in power. We have, and I think India is replete with women in leadership position, but India also has been ahead of the, of the curve by having prime ministers and presidents uh, as, as women in leaders. But the life of these women is not easy. And this is where, why, as I said, uh, as I said earlier on, why we need women in, in political position, because the decisions which are taken at the level of that uh, particular time, when uh, an important decision is being taken, it is usually bent towards better equity in their family, for the society and everything else. And this can only happen when women are there. That's why we make a case for women to be in that position of power. And uh, there are many countries that are taking this very seriously. And again, here, I think I have to, to sing the, you know, I have to wax lyrical, as I say, with what is happening in Nordic countries. Because there, they really have taken the bull by the horn and address it very seriously as a matter of policy, as a matter of law. And those, for example, the boards that do not have that minimum, the quota of 30% female representation in the board, the state has the power to close them down. So this is what the kind of narrative that we need in our country is that women should feel comforted by the fact that the law is there to protect them and protect their interests. Talking about feminist leadership and progress in advancing gender equality, we've seen a few very powerful women who ran top leadership positions in their country and shifted to heading UN bodies, such as Helen Clark, who was former prime minister of New Zealand heading UNDP. She also ran for the position of UN secretary general. There is Michelle Bachelet, former president of Chile, and she headed UN organizations as well. There is also also Mary Robinson, former Irish president who joined as the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights. Do you also see yourself pursuing a similar career trajectory with your experience in science and in politics? Where do you see yourself in five years? My vision is to serve. So if I have served at the highest level in my country, so if I can serve at a, at, at a high level again in the international community, I'm ready. You're ready. Well, I want to wish you, um, you know, the very best of luck for that. Coming to my last question, what advice would you have for women aiming for leadership positions? We've seen a lot of women leaving careers midway or backing off due to personal or various professional reasons. What would your advice be to them? I would say that uh, they have to dream big and they have to sustain their vision and their goal and their passion. Do take risk and just enjoy what they do. Because uh, just like Confucius said, if you enjoy whatever you do, you know, you will not have to work a single day in your life. And that's what I've done. Excellent. Thank you so much, Dr. Amina. Thank this you. was an amazing conversation and it was wonderful to have you on the Sanya Faruqi show today. Thank you, Samia, and all the very best. And for those of you who've tuned in, thank you so much for watching. I hope you will subscribe to our YouTube channel, follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Spotify, and Instagram, and do sign up for our newsletter. I'm going to see you again next time.